there, folks. My name is Dan Goodman, and I want to welcome you to another exciting rendition of Stormwind Studios' succinct held online remote training sessions, or shorts, as we like to call them. This is technically the ninth short in the Wireless LAN Essential series of shorts that picks up on the previous one by discussing some of the various access point options. We've talked about the models, we've talked about the modes, now we kind of talk about the options at our disposal, specifically power options, mounting options, and the antenna options. So our main topics of discussion are gonna focus on these three key areas. We kind of lump them in with each other because they all kind of have a unique relationship with each other. For example, the power and antenna options can really affect where and how your access point gets mounted if it's mountable at all. So the first thing to discuss is going to be the power methods. Now there are various access point power options, including the Cisco switches, which actually provide up to 15.4 watts via power over ethernet or PoE. One thing that you wanna factor in is what we talked about with the uh, add-on modules for certain access point models. So the wireless uh, intrusion prevention module, the 802.11 AC wave two module, you need to factor those because the more stuff you add to an access point, the more power it's gonna require. So in most cases, a standard PoE switch will not be able to power those access points plus their modules. So in scenarios like those, you would have to add an injector in addition to the power that comes from the PoE switch. The standard power supply is always going to be included with each access point, the air power, as we used to say uh, during my days in basic training. Uh, but those are the standard power supplies that, that pretty much come in the box with all of your access points. Finally, we have those power injectors that I just mentioned a second ago. These models all provide Cisco proprietary versions of PoE. So we have the J3, it's got a longer name than that, but if you take a look at the last couple of characters, it's the J3, the J4, the J5. J3 is for standard PoE. J4 is going to be for PoE+, plus, basically ramping up to 30 watts. J5 is a lower cost PoE, which is kind of funny to think about. You would think J5 would be the highest one, but it actually only has the ability to go up to 15.4 watts. Now the J3 and J4 are primarily designed with the 3600 series in mind. J5 can be used on almost any access point. And I keep thinking about blank man every time I say J5. So we'll just move on from there. Movie references aside. Uh, anyways, the access point mounting options. So this kind of uh, takes the next step. We've got the access point modules, the access points themselves, the power options. Now we start looking at the mounting options. So the air AP bracket one is considered low profile. Really the best option when it comes to mounting your access point below the ceiling tiles. However, it won't accommodate networking and the electrical requirements, and you also can't use it for wall mounts. It's pretty much, here are your ceiling tiles, this is where you can mount it, that's about it. You'd have to cut the ceiling tile or the drywall to really pipe in the cabling that you need to power on the access point and give it its connectivity. Now those, the air, uh, the AP bracket one, those are going to be shipped by default unless you specify otherwise during the ordering process. The bracket two is considered to be a universal bracket that adapts well with networking and the electrical requirements and can also be used for wall mounting scenarios. It's not as flush as the low profile option, but definitely a lot more flexible and a lot more accommodating with the stuff that you pretty much need with an access point. Bracket three is a flush mount for those of us who want that streamlined look. You know, the brackets there, you can see they're, they're brackets. They're not very pretty to look at. So the uh, bracket three mounts the access point into the actual tile itself for visual aesthetics. However, the entire ceiling tile would need to be removed in order to access the access point, which is never a fun day. The bracket seven is gonna be the default ceiling mount bracket for the 702i access point model. Neither of the previously mentioned brackets will work with the 700 series. So this is kind of the one that's specifically designed for it, if you will. 
Bracket W is the default for the 702W. It's also known as the wall plate access point. It mounts the access point on a wall using standard wall plates, like the things that we find for outlets and light switches and those sorts of things. So you don't have to cut any more holes in that regard, and usually you have power coming into them anyways. Now, in addition to the brackets themselves, there are some mounting considerations to consider. Allow myself to introduce myself, if you will. Some of the do's and the don'ts, if you will. The do's, mount the access point with the antenna pointing straight down. This will maximize your overall coverage area. Mount the access point above or below obstructions, never at the same level. This will avoid negatively impacting the signal quality. In most cases, it's gonna be more above than below, but just make sure it's not right at those obstructions. You wanna position the access points appropriately based upon the service you are deploying or the expected client load. Heavy duty applications are gonna benefit from more access points. Heavy duty client loads would benefit from load balancing among the access points. Now some of the don'ts, don't mount the access point within free, three feet of metal obstructions. You wanna factor in things like metal ducts, conduit, water pipes, elevator shafts, metal walls, adamantium claws, all of those things are gonna factor into the discussion. Mount those access points more than 100 feet apart or higher than 20 feet. This is the don't category. Now this is obviously gonna be dependent upon your model and your coverage requirements. If the access points are too far from each other, that can impact roaming. So they don't need to be more than 100 feet apart in most cases. If they're too high in the ceiling, you know, more, more than 20 feet, you have to think about maintenance. What happens when that access point goes down? Do you, do you got a, a 20 foot ladder lying around? Probably not. If you visit most uh, blue and orange stores, they're about 14 feet unless you pay extra for the big giant ones. Now, all of this information should be made available to you if you take the time to do a thorough site survey. That is why it is very important to the deployment process. Finally, we have the antenna options themselves. Obviously, this is going to be another option that is dependent upon the model of access point. Models with internal antennas are pretty much what you got is what you have, or what you have is what you got. Basically, what you purchase is what you're stuck with. You can't really swap out those internal antennas. Models with external antennas are obviously more modular in nature. The different types of antennas are gonna radiate the signal in different ways. Once again, the information about the actual performance in your deployment environment would be provided by a thorough site survey. The antennas themselves are gonna differentiate themselves based upon a couple of key criteria. So these are terms that you're gonna see in other areas of wireless networking. Basically, gain, direction, and polarization. Gain is the amount of power increase an antenna is going to provide. Basically, the higher the gain, the better the quality of signal you're going to get. Every antenna gain is going to be measured against what is called the isotropic antenna. Now, the isotropic antenna is kind of a... Uh, uh, what's the term I'm thinking of? Like a great white buffalo, if you will. It's a theoretical antenna that's used as a standard baseline. It doesn't actually exist, but we've kind of created it to use it as a reference point. Now, by comparison, a dipole antenna is a real antenna. However, we don't use it as a baseline measurement for gain. Gain is gonna be measured in decibels and is gonna be displayed as either DBI or DBD, basically decibels against the isotropic antenna or decibels against the dipole antenna. Now the direction is another uh, evaluation, if you will, about the antenna. It basically identifies and describes the shape of the transmission pattern. We use the dipole antenna for the measurement for direction. So really we use the isotropic for gain, we use direction with the dipole uh, measurement. The, I, the isotropic antenna exists within a three-dimensional space, which is why it's perfect for measuring gain. The dipole antennas exist within 360 degrees in the horizontal plane and 75 degrees in the vertical plane space. 
Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, three dimensional, 360 degrees, isn't that kind of the same thing? It sounds similar, but it's actually different. You need to think about the isotropic antenna as kind of existing within a sphere. Think of the dipole antenna kind of existing like a donut, where the center of the donut is actually the antenna and it kind of radiates out from there, whereas the isotropic antenna kind of goes in a sphere, so to speak, up, down, left, way, sideways, and those sorts of things. Now, the direction is going to concentrate the signal to a certain extent, thereby adding some gain to the signal. Now, if you ever need to compare the dipole measurement to the isotropic measurement, you basically add 2.14 dB in the horizontal plane. Most dipole antennas provide a 2.2 dBi amount of gain. Polarization is the last characteristic. The antennas are going to generate electromagnetic waves that vary in time as they travel. Certain antennas are more sensitive to these waves than other antennas. Regardless of the sensitivity, the antennas with the same polarization will have the same, or I'm sorry, the best communication path. We need to recognize here for a second that communication via antennas is kind of like playing baseball. Uh, where you have to throw the ball and catch the ball. You just can't throw the ball. Somebody has to be able to catch it, right? And of course, if somebody throws it to you, you should also be able to catch it. In wireless terms, recognize that it is a communication. That means the transmitting and the receiving. If we were just concerned with the transmitting of a signal, we wouldn't be talking about this stuff, but it's also how the signal is received because we can send it in any direction, but if it's not received, it's like it never even happened. Now, polarization has the ability to affect both AP to client and AP to AP signal quality. Now, when you look at the antennas we have listed here with the bright colors and the pretty pictures, they basically fall into two families, omnidirectional and directional. Omnidirectional antennas are going to focus more on coverage area than coverage distance. The goal of the omnidirectional antenna is to provide a more circular radiation pattern. So that means there's different types. There's going to be the basic omnidirectional antenna. Your average run-of-the-mill antenna usually ships by default. The Cisco Aeronet 5.2 DBI high gain omnidirectional antenna gives us much larger coverage areas. The 5.2 dBi omnidirectional antenna is a non-proprietary version of a higher gain antenna. Special omnis are essentially two patch antennas that have been slapped to next to each other back to back. Very useful in hallways and I'll do my best to kind of physically demonstrate that. If I'm the access point and I'm on a long hallway, I can actually slap two of those antennas back to back, essentially one kind of going out this way and one kind of going out this way. So that's typically where you see them. You're welcome for that, by the way. Anyways, the directional antenna is the second major family. They come in various styles and shapes. Uh, there's the Yagi, which is intended for long corridors and or warehouses. The patch antenna is a wall mount antenna that provides slightly more gain than an omnidirectional one. And then there's parabolic dishes, which are intended for outdoor long range links. Now the directional antennas focus their energy in one particular direction, which essentially increases the energy while sacrificing other directions. If you kind of think about it, an omnidirectional antenna would be running down the field in a zig zigzag pattern. It technically covers more area. The directional runs down the field in a straight line, covering more distance. We basically get better coverage distance with a smaller coverage area. Now, because of all these connectors and power options, we also have to factor in the cabling. Cisco devices use a variety of antenna connectors based upon the indoor and outdoor, the antenna type, and the access point model. The reverse polarity threaded needle councilman, or RPTNC, is used with indoor access points. The N connector is primarily used for outdoor access points. And when you take a look at the picture, you can see why. One looks a little bit more resistant to weather, if you think about it. Uh, other vendors may have the sub-miniature version A or SMA and the reverse polarity SMA, otherwise known as RP SMA, 
or the SMA reverse sex, S-M-A-R-S. So a lot of SMAs in there. There are several other versions that are out there, but these are the most common ones. These are the ones that Cisco tends to include in their documentation. The most important thing to remember is that both ends have to have an exact match. Being in the same family won't suffice. The TNC and the RPTNC are both TNCs, but we can't mix up the two. It has to be TNC to TNC or RP and R ABC123 RPTNC to RPTNC, if you will. Now, there may also be instances where the antenna is not directly connected to the access point. It's kind of split off. Cisco offers two types of cables for these scenarios. Basically, the LMR400 that comes in the 20-foot and 50-foot varieties. The LMR600 comes in 100 and the 150-foot varieties. So that's all we have here for our ninth Wireless LAN Essential Short. Thanks for watching our short on all things Wireless LAN Essentials. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you're notified of new shorts as shortly as possible. Take care.